My life is in a rut. I hate to admit it, but these days just feel like a never-ending dig, slogging through the tedious demands of everyday living, and the cruel reality that I am a slave to my routines, a tool with no purpose, a lump of mass disposable to the greater society. I know full well of my insignificance, and yet I continue to move forward. But to what end? What propels me to keep going? Is it simply out of dull boredom? Or maybe, just maybe, is that tiny flame burning inside me, fueling a weak desire to reach some sort of ending and claim a reward that I never knew was waiting for my arrival? What? The f- Tengen Tapa Gurren Lagan. There's a little something for everyone. Do you love giant mech fights? Do you care for constant evolutions? Are you a fan of interracial love stories? Or may I assume you're one of culture and like your shows to have j just a dab of jiggle physics? If so, this might be the show for you. Coming from Gainax, the same studio that brought you Evangelion, Fully Cooley, and the comedic duo known as Penny and Stalking, Gurren Lagan is not simply a show. It's a lifestyle. You may think I'm exaggerating, but just about every episode empowers you with the thought of pushing past your limitations, believing in the best version of yourself, and taking on any oppressor who stands in the way of your dreams and desires. It is an anime that carries an intensifying identity from beginning to end, and just about every aspect of it is memorable. The character designs are so variated and aesthetically pleasing, however you want to remember them, that by the end of the show, one look at this iconic logo, and you'll understand why it's on par with the symbolism similar to that map from V for Vendetta. The animation is by far the most appealing factor, filled with high energy action, gorgeous imagery packed with a thousand emotions, the visual weight of every punch and kick flying out of your screen, and the music! Oh my god, no matter how many years, decades go by, Sorario Days will always be a banger. It is actually a crime Netflix would give you the option to skip over this intro. I just can't go into an episode without backtracking to the beginning, pulling the volume on full blast, and at the top of my lungs, singing HASHILI DASHI this is a very fun show, and the fact that half my audience has never watched it makes me so excited to talk about it today. Going beyond the realm of literature works, the story of Gurren Lagan can be enjoyed both in the written and visual sense, which is why I can fully understand why there are some that say not to take the story too seriously. This story could survive by visuals alone. In its simplest form, Gurren Lagan is about a team of spirited rebels who fight against the world and its oppressive forces, with their emotions and purposes translated into explosive action. Understanding that much, you can freely appreciate the animation and suspend your disbelief, which is highly encouraged because this show goes places you'd never imagine. But the fact that it also has a rich storyline as well makes it even better, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Why, after all these years, does this anime still stick with me? And why do I consider it one of the best anime stories out there? For any newcomers, I hope you're prepared to spiral down this incredible journey. It's manly, it's emotional, empowering, a bit perverted, mostly in the first half, definitely weird, but badass at the same time. This is Gurren Lagann. For the first 8 episodes, the show's at its peak. Since the stakes are fairly low, people can enjoy the comedic chemistry between our main characters and their first time experiences above the surface, as well as get a feel for the ongoing war against these animal-human hybrids known as Beastmen, who pilot these giant mecha robots called Gunmen. Humanity has been forced to live on the ground because of them. Whenever there's an earthquake, you can always suspect that a Beastman is nearby. It's been this way for hundreds of years now, and the people have grown accustomed to this lifestyle and accepted their fates. Except for one stubborn dreamer. Ever since witnessing his dad go alone in this man's world, Kamina has always wanted to leave the confines of his village and reach the sky that had no ceiling to worry about. He's the definition of manliness. All the girls can't help but instantly fall for him. The things he says are pretty stupid and make no sense, but he says it with enough gusto and self-confidence that attracts followers, including our main character, Simone, who's more weak and timid by comparison. Everyone sees Simone as a boy who's simply good at digging holes, but Kamina sees more. To him, Simone is a loyal brother in arms who has the power to make their dreams come true. And even if Simone can't see it himself, Kamina will always be there to remind him of his potential. <laughs> 
The first episode does an incredible job establishing their dynamic and introducing the fight above, thanks to the show's fan service Yoko. Being forced to live on the surface, her village is always having to survive against the gunmen on a daily basis, and it's thanks to the arrival of Kamen and Simone that the battle becomes an even playing field. The name Lagan is for the buried gunman Simone found during one of his digs with the special ability to combine with other mechas and Gurren refers to both as the name for communist team of rebels and the name for his own gunman when he successfully poaches one for himself. Mix them together and Gurren Lagan reflects the bond of two brothers who are constantly moving forward evolving their skills and numbers every episode and have their indomitable spirits scream loud enough to become the center of attention for both allies and enemies to hear. Yet, not everyone answers. There's this one episode where the team falls into this village similar to Plato's allegory of the cave. These villagers have never seen the surface and treat the face of a gunman as their god, basing their cultish practices around it. As much as Kamina spouts about the reality of the surface and what this god really stands for, it's a fight he can't win. The high priest Majin feigns ignorance for the sake of his people and keeps the peace by sticking to traditions they are familiar with. However, his son Rossio starts to question these beliefs and joins the team on their journey along with two excommunicated orphans, Gimme and Dari, hoping to fight for a world that will no longer need these terrible laws. Episodes like these provide a good amount of world building. It's not so much about the landscapes, but the views these villagers harbor and the lifestyles they adapted just to survive any way they can. We mostly come across fighters who answer to the call of Team Gurren and offer their assistance, but as you're watching the show, specifically in the first half, there are just some locales that add a little more to the overarching story. That's what's so great about the show. Even in its execution, there's always something evolving. The surface world continues to expand throughout the journey. Communist actions and encouragement pushes his followers forward and instills hope that the possibility for a better tomorrow is within reach. It rarely feels like any step is being taken backwards, unless it revolves around our main character, Simone. Sometimes it's easy to forget that this is his story because he's always outshined by his big bro, Kamina. In the episode where the team meet their rival, Viro, yes, that's definitely his name, Yoko questions why Kamina continues to have so much faith in a scared boy like Simone, who's constantly doubting himself and wishing that they should just go back home. They work so well together because their strengths and weaknesses complement one another. Without Simone, Kamina would literally keep fighting until he dies and acknowledges how important Simone is to keeping him grounded. And Kamina knows that Simone wants to fight as well but just lacks the courage so he makes sure to provide enough courage for the both of them. With the heart of a fighter and a reasonable mind, these two become an unstoppable force and it becomes necessary when these villain of the week episodes finally reach a bigger plot point. Meeting Vero for the second time, Team Gurren also encounters Timoth, one of the four generals to the mysterious Spiral King, who is responsible for producing these beastmen. They finally made enough noise to capture the ruler's attention and once they bought themselves time by sending his fortress of a gunman down at the bottom of a ravine, Kamina makes a plan to use Simone's combining ability to take control of that gunman for themselves. The success of this mission rides on Simone's shoulders and feeling a bit scared but somewhat confident, all of that is shattered from seeing something he wasn't meant to see. For Simone, this was really heartbreaking. Remember, this kid has always been under communist shadow and when it came to girls, they would either call him lame or fall for the cooler man standing right beside him. Yoko was the first girl who kind of treated him like his own person, always there to support him and simply paid attention to him from time to time. Simone misread the relationship hoping that there was something more and seeing that really messed with his head at the worst possible time too. During the capture mission, right when Simone is trying to take control of the enemy's gunmen, the memories alter with his focus forcing Kamina to once again step in to save the day. <laughs> But this isn't just some goon they're fighting, their opponents are much more ruthless and Simone had to learn the hard way what that moment of distraction cost. We've all seen it coming. As much as Kamino is a good fighter and all, he was still pretty reckless and it would only be a matter of time until his actions faced some grave consequences. I mean, the way they combined always looked like a near-death experience, and that conversation between him and Yoko the previous night came off as a super red flag. Yet, 
I still tear up every time. There's just something about brotherly bonds that gets to me, maybe because I have something similar in my own personal life. And I love how it's demonstrated in this episode. With the spirit of Team Gurren lying on his deathbed, everyone is panicking and Simone, so distraught with his emotions, loses control and is heading to die guns in straight into a volcano. Kamina gathers what little strength he has left to reassure Simone that everything's okay. Long enough to defeat Tim Oaf with an intense comeback, introducing their finisher move, the Giga Drill Breaker. He went down the way he wanted to go, giving Simone his final words of encouragement, and in a blaze of glory, died with a smile on his face. Abayo, that's cool. Aniki? Aniki? From here on out, the days of fun died alongside Kamina, significantly shifting the tone of the show. Losing that rebellion spirit, Simone and the rest of Team Daigurin would have to keep moving forward, going against even more dangerous foes. The world stops for no one, not even for Simone. My first time watching this, I never thought that this show could get this depressing based on the lighthearted introduction, but here it was, and I was very happy for it. It was a clear sign that this anime had much more substance than I originally thought, and to eliminate a fan favorite so early on is such a ballsy move that you can't help but see what happens next. This portion of the show gives a perfect representation of depression and uses about three episodes to let the feeling sink in, giving viewers and the characters a chance to process this tremendous grief. The recent additions of Team Daigurin aren't wounded like the remaining trio, but they are concerned about what the next step is and who's going to take charge now because it's very clear who they came to fight for. <laughs> Out of the two, Yoko is handling the loss much better. It hurts like hell, but already living in war has made her tough to understand that this fight has its casualties. However, Simone, who until recently has always lived in the comfort of his hole, being secure by the thought of his role model always being there, had all his hope extinguished, digging himself into this pit of despair, not knowing if there was any way forward. And what makes the episode following Kamina's death so memorable is its use of psychological lighting. Now, there are a lot of scenes and still frames that manage to highlight the beauty in this war zone, but episode 9 in particular ties the environment with the characters' emotions at their bleakest. The monochrome sky and foggy atmosphere meshes well with Simone's current state of mind, giving some of the show's more gruesome fights as he's clearing out gunmen by driven anger, lashing out at his comrades for acting so recklessly, and even criticizing poor Rossio for not living up to Simone's high expectations. Simon Deep in grief, Simone is trying so hard to become Kamina, losing both himself and the ability to properly pilot Lagan. It all starts to feel like a dead end until he unlocks a refrigerated princess in a box. This is Nia. Daughter to the Spiral King, Simone saving Grace, and the literal replacement to Kamina, right down to the intro. At his weakest, the gods basically delivered Simone a beaming spark of positivity in the form of a beautiful girl. For being self-aware of her existence, the Spiral King threw her away in the box and sent her to die alongside her previous sisters. Luckily, Simone fell into the right ditch and saved her, giving her a chance to see the world through the eyes of humans, sympathizing with enough of their pain to join the fight and get a free ride to her father, Lord Genome. All the other crew members are crazy for her, especially after learning about her father abandoning her. Some took longer to warm up with, but Nia just has this innocent charm about her that you can't help but love and will protect at all costs. And when it comes to Simone, it makes sense why she took over Kamina's place. With a gentler approach, she stays close to him and tries to guide him to the realization that he isn't Kamina and isn't so helpless without him. And like Kamina, putting yourself in danger seems like the most efficient strategy to get Simone to act, such as the case when General Adine is seconds away from snapping her in half. One of my favorite Nia scenes, because even with the entire crew stepping in to save her, she acknowledges the fact that Simone acted first and makes sure that he knew she knew. <laughs> Simon, 
Yet, what pulls Simone out of his slump is during their capture by General Guam. After falling for a booby trap, Team Digurn is trapped, and while everyone hopelessly fails to make an escape, they all fall quiet to the boy who keeps on digging, reminding Yoko of something Kamina once said. During one of their attempts to reach the surface, an earthquake trapped Team Gurren in a tight spot. Simone always believed that it was because of Kamina's encouragement and spirit that he was able to dig him out to safety. But from Kamina's perspective, Simone was the one who kept the spirit alive. <laughs> We had a glimpse of Kamina's fear early on, when he was first gained the hang of Pinelin Gurren. Seeing this skull, later to be revealed as the remains of his old man, showed that he had his worries too, but always remembering that back that kept on digging against all odds, it goes to show who was really pulling who in the end. Simone had been desperately trying to become Kamina, not realizing that Kamina was looking up to him as well. Finally being comfortable with who he is, Simone regains the will to live again and summons Lagan, saving Nia and declaring his leadership role as Simone the Digger. From here, Simone becomes his own person, which is another factor that makes him and Nia so good together. Similar to how much Simone believed in Kamina, Nia had high beliefs for her father, thinking that his actions were for the benefit of society. But after her run-ins with the general, seeing firsthand the problems Team Digurn and the rest of humanity are suffering, she joins this internal strive for a clear identity, and with the proper burial for her sisters, steps away from the past and takes the next step forward on her own values and beliefs. This part of the story deals a lot with closure, and not just for our heroes. I haven't talked much about Vero in the beginning because during this portion of the anime post Kamina, his character starts to blossom by the amount of losses he takes from Team Digurn. When he was first introduced, he was seen as a real threat to the team, but with the introduction of the generals, his role is quickly diminished to that of a lowly foot soldier, and the show really tries to make you sympathize by the way he's treated by his superiors, especially Adine. <laughs> All this does is reinforce his hate for Team Digurn and is constantly begging the joint forces with his superiors to make up for his failures, hoping to get that moment of redemption. But all he got was more humiliation when he found out that the Gurn logging he was fighting this whole time wasn't Kamina. All this time, he was under the impression that Kamina was still alive, and to find out that he's been losing to a boy made him finally question himself, with the Spiral King no less. It's an answer we don't get until the second half because Simone really needs to kick his ass. The Spiral King says he's doing this all for the sake of humanity, but after all that's been lost and sacrificed, Simone can't see this man as a savior and engages in this brutal clash that will decide the fate of the earth. It ends with Simone unlocking all his power inside Lord Genome, making a really big hole out of him, and right before dying, the Spiral King leaves behind one final message. It's a cryptic send off, but Team Digurn decided to leave that for another day, relishing in their current victory. Even without their fearless leader, Team Digurn managed to bounce back stronger than ever and brought about peace for the surface world. Not just for Kamina, not just for the fallen, but for all of humanity, showing once again that with enough determination and spirit, Nothing is impossible. That's just the Gurren Logan way. And now we've reached the time skip. You either love it or you hate it. I like it a lot, but I'll admit that's also ridiculous. There's no way around it. We go from apocalyptic mech fights to a galactic war against the ultimate threat against humanity, known as the Anti-Spiral. If you thought the first half was pretty crazy to follow, consider that a mere appetizer. Here, the moon that Kamina has always envisioned of visiting comes to threaten their whole existence and even becoming a gunman to make it happen. There's a literal ocean in space that swallows them alive and converts their spiral power to mass. The mechs become such godly titans that their final fight takes place in the field of galaxies, even wielding them as a form of arsenal. The insanity is on its own level, all to prove the same idea that anything could be accomplished with the right amount of faith and determination. But the way they get here opens up a social commentary about the balance between reckless ambitions and suppressing that drive for the greater good, centered around the Spiral King's final words. In seven years, their next step forward was made to prevent this forewarning from happening. 
communist city was created to keep the population under the new government's eye so they could carefully watch the numbers. Their own NASA was developed to scout the moon and see if they could find the threat themselves. And what's worse, this threat practically splits the group and their approaches, specifically between Simone and Rossiu. Simone and the majority of the older team members have basically become boomers, sticking to their old model of fighting whatever comes at them, not really paying much mind to rules and advances, and that comes at a cost when Simone defeats an enemy without a full analysis of what it was capable of. <laughs> Meanwhile, Rossio represents the new generation, trying to maintain the peace and follows the rules they implemented to make sure that the population stays below a million, and slowly adopts practices similar to his own father back in his home village. Basically, these two extremes go about this problem based on their upbringings, not trying to understand one another. It's much easier to hate Rossio during this time because, yeah, some of the things he does goes against everything Team Diagern was about, almost as if he learned nothing by their actions. When Simone's actions caused the public to turn against the government, Rossio's immediate thought was to throw Simone under the bus and have him sentenced to death, putting the whole trial in his favor. He didn't think twice about putting Kitan's sister in danger by strapping her to bombs to make sure Simone returned to him safely. And when he takes the Spiral King's approach of putting people back underground, only to have it backfire by the prediction of assimilation, he accepts whatever he can take and tries to save only a select few. But again, this is a first for all of them, and he's only like, what, 17, 18, it wasn't that long, and already he's the supreme commander of the city? No shit he's going to make mistakes, he's a teenager leading the world. But Simone wasn't exactly any better, while his actions were for the people, his emotions were riled up when he learned that Nia became a messenger for the anti-spiral, and went to action blindly, plus the guy even admitted that he was hoping to get back in the front lines. <laughs> Seven years living in peace changes a person, or in Simone's case, not much change at all. Thinking that communist words will be all he needed to push through life's problems wasn't enough anymore, and Rossiu got so carried away with protecting an entire civilization that he became too cautious for his own good, succumbed to the pressure, and got his head so warped that he was about to end himself until Simone helped the only way he knew how. Ah! <laughs> No matter the challenge, Team Daigurin never ran from a fight. That's what Rossio had forgotten, and by acknowledging each other's strengths and weaknesses, the two finally started working as one again. Rossio was to take care of Earth, while Simone and the original team Daigurin fighters, along with Vero, who after receiving so many backhands from this group, was given the role as Gurn's new pilot, braced themselves for one final fight to protect the Earth. As for why they're fighting, it all comes down to spiral power. To simplify it, every life form has spiral power, with the potential to destroy the universe, and that event is known as the spiral nemesis. The ones who have suppressed their evolution are known as the anti-spiral, and to prevent the possibility of the spiral nemesis, they have traveled through several galaxies and exterminated any species that showed the slightest hint of evolving too fast. The Spiral King tried to fight the anti-spiral in the past and failed, leaving him no choice but to keep the human race underground, using his army of beastmen as a fear tactic to keep the more ambitious down. With this information, people like Lord Genome and Father Manjin could be seen as good people who were simply thinking about humanity as a whole, while Team Gurren has unknowingly been leading the world towards a galactic enemy who's only thinking about the safety of the universe itself. Is that clear? <sighs> AK, it's another oppressor, just another ceiling for them to break through, this time on an intergalactic level. Ironically, it was because of this threat that brought them together, doing what we all loved about the show for the last time. And what a battle it is, lives are sacrificed to keep the fight in their favor, Gurren Lagan keeps transforming to such a colossal height that he could take on literal planets being thrown at him. The closest they were to losing was from the Anti-Spiral's final attempt, sending Simone and the team into a realm of alternative possibilities. Simone, for instance, was transported to a timeline where Kamina was still alive, and the two have gotten rich enough to live a wealthy life within the confines of the village. However, the trade-off was getting the Kamina who would never push forward, and it's thanks to the real Kamina that Simone was able to snap out of it. Uh, 
Truly one of my favorite scenes of this show, giving us an idea of how much Simone has grown since the beginning. No longer a boy following another man's ideals, he stands tall and proud, making his own path and becoming a true inspiration to others. Also, getting the look into Viral's dream world was surprisingly tragic. Since he doesn't have the capability to reproduce, all he wanted was his own family. Yet, thanks to Simone, he understood that this wasn't real. None of it was real. And they were willing to sacrifice such a lifestyle for freedom much bigger than themselves. Breaking through the illusions, there's nothing left but the anti-spiral himself, leading into a godly battle in the stars so grand that even the people on Earth could spectate right outside their backyards. All the spiral warriors band together to fight for their home, their existence, and more importantly, for the chance to prove that they aren't as destructive as the anti-spiral thinks. That's what Gurren Lagann is. That's what it's always been. And this spectacular clash with the music ramping, the animation intensifying and keeping up with all the chaos and harnessing the willpower of those who have fallen and the hopes of a brighter tomorrow, Simone pushes through the oppression until he is launched straight into the heart of the anti-spiral, drilling straight into its existence and promising to maintain the peace from here on out. That ending was truly amazing. And then it just spits in your face. I did it. Really? Really? You couldn't give him this? This man literally went through the entire universe just to get his girl back. How could you take that away from him? And you expect me to believe that he's going to walk this off with a smile on his face, looking forward to a bright tomorrow. I don't care how stoic you might be. I don't care how stone-like your balls are. That had to hurt. I was hurt. Seeing such a peach like Nia disappearing right in front of you, Someone chose for that to happen. This was a choice I was not okay with. No matter what your reasons, I won't accept it. I call complete bull. <laughs> this show is just an exhilarating high, and if you give it a chance, you might find something enjoyable. The music in OST will always stick with you, and the animation is pretty consistent throughout, aside from episode 4. There's actually a whole thing with that one episode that actually led to an animator's firing. If you want to know more about it, read it if you're interested. But it's so amazing to me how much weight a frame could carry with some of these gorgeous shots and scenes that make a lasting impression. And the pacing is incredible, there's always something being developed and it never feels like filler, unless you perceive it to be so. People might not like the slow startup at the start of the second half, but I enjoyed it. It was like watching a group of friends who, after seven quiet years of peace, slowly drifted away and were brought back together by a common enemy, reminding the public what this future was built upon, what the overly confident common had taught them so long ago. A lot of stuff near the end is pretty nonsense, I know, but it's nonsense that's pretty acceptable in this world. There's some truth to not taking it too seriously, because the show really hammers in the same message about believing in yourself and fighting with everything you've got. As long as you understand that much, most of the explanations of reasonings can pretty much be dumbed down to this core idea. I just want you to see how impactful this was during its time. I've heard stories, I've seen reviews about how much this one anime changed people's lives, how they became better people because of it. Nothing will get done if you're just sitting on your ass waiting for your future to arrive on a silver platter. You make the change you want to see. Just don't be reckless about it. That's what the epilogue tells us, at least the way I see it. Rossiya was entrusted with calming the city knowing that the next generation would do a much better job protecting the planet with caution. And if trouble were to come knocking again, Simone will be around to provide the kick if needed. We need a rebelling spirit, but also a sound mind to keep it in check. That's what was so great about the dynamic between Simone and Kamina. You need both to survive. This is one of the few animes I would recommend to someone who's never seen an anime before because getting from here to here is done at such a steady pace that you won't get lost. If you're not much for subs, there's actually an English dub version out there as well, and it's not bad at all. I was pretty surprised at how many voices I recognized, two from the Persona series and even Starfire as a young Nia. If 27 episodes seems like a lot, there are also two movies summarizing the entire story, although I would still recommend the show. The second movie is a lot better than the first, especially for how they extended the finale against the anti-spiral, including this raw fist fight. I watch it just for that scene, but the show will provide a better experience. But you don't have to believe me. You know what, don't even believe yourself. Believe in the you that I believe in, and the likely chance that this will be the craziest yet magnificent thing you've ever seen in your life. That's Tengen Toppa. That's Gurren Lagann. A show that will raise your spirits and show you how to pierce the heavens. <laughs>